Let's get started, guys. Good to see you again. Looks like uh, the last person who wrote on the board took a few days for them to erase it, so left uh, fairly permanent marks, but hopefully you can see it. Um, hope you guys on the fourth row, I don't know if you can see me up here. I hope it's readable. Plenty of room in the front. So uh, the material that I'm going to cover today is uh, chapter 4.6 and 4.7 today. And what we're going to do is I want to give you guys an intuition about uh, what do we mean by uncertainty and where uncertainty comes from when we do estimation. Um, we're going to see that when we're trying to estimate a parameter, part of the uncertainty comes from the noise in our measurements. Part of it comes from the fact that the data that we're getting may not be exploring the space very much. So for example, if I have an input variable x that is telling me something about the relationship between inputs and measurement variable y, if x has many dimensions, but I'm only exploring some small region in those many dimensions, then the uncertainty that I have in estimating the parameter w is going to reflect the space that we moved around in that x space. So if x is something that is like, you know, five dimensions, but three of those dimensions are only very occasionally measured, then the uncertainty that I have in my estimate of w is going to reflect the fact that x didn't get explored very much. And this is going to be reflected in that variance of my estimate for w. So my uncertainty for this variable w is reflected in this variance, and that variance depends on not just the measurement noise, but also how the input was sampled. Now, what this is going to lead to us is to segue to a very important algorithm, which for many people reflects really the most important engineering discovery in terms of mathematical discovery of the 20th century, which is called the Kalman filter. And we're going to derive the Kalman algorithm today. And it's particularly relevant to us because the guy came up with it, Rudolf Kalman, came up with this algorithm basically a few blocks from where you guys are sitting on Balboa Street while he was working here in 19, late 1950s, 1959 or so. So it has historic value. In fact, personally, I think we should build a statue for the guy to reflect this amazing thing that he did while he was uh, in Baltimore. So the idea of a common filter is the notion that we're going to estimate a parameter in such a way that we will minimize our uncertainty about it after we alter our belief about it. So we're going to have some prior belief about what this parameter is, we're going to make some measurements, and then we're going to combine these two things to form a posterior belief. And that posterior belief is going to be made in such a way to minimize our uncertainty. And so today, the discussions are about uncertainty. What is uncertainty? Where does it come from? And basically, as I mentioned, uncertainty comes from two sources. Your measurement noise, and also the way the input has been sampled. And so the input isn't very sampled very well, you're not going to be able to have much certainty about it. So in our discussion, we'll see that the history of the inputs is really reflected in our uncertainty about the parameter that we're trying to estimate. Again, imagining your inputs have many dimensions, and maybe most of the time you see some activity in two or three of those dimensions, but occasionally you see some activity in the other dimensions. That history, the way the input space was sampled, will be reflected in the uncertainty that we're going to have in our estimate. And that uncertainty is really a reflection of the past history of that input. And this uncertainty, which is basically our estimate of variance associated with the parameter that we're trying to estimate, is the key thing that's going to be used in combining the difference between what we see and what we predicted, our error in prediction, with the past history of it. So basically we're going to have just like when we did you know, the two GPSs, we have two GPSs, we're walking around, the two are two pieces of information. Now what we're going to think about is that one of these pieces of information is the past, all the things we've seen in the past. The other piece of information is what we've seen now. And we're going to combine those two things to form a belief. So just like what we did before. But now, this past is reflected in all the information that came, not just the current information. And the, the other one is our prediction error that we see from the current event. So the theme today is going to be this notion of uncertainty, and then we're going to drive the, um, the algorithm that, that's going to show us how to combine information 
from the past to the present, and so the common filter. So I want to start with uh, just a little bit of a reminder about what is a variance covariance matrix, because that's going to be one of the key things in our discussion. So when I have a va random variable x that's normally distributed with 0, 0, and um, variance 1, 2, minus square root of 2, minus square root of 2, something like this, well, now, if I were to plot this random variable, if I were to sample this random variable from this distribution, so here's x1, here's x2. This is a vector, of course, x being distributed normally as follows. So the x is made up of x1 and x2. The mean of my dots that I'm going to sample, of course, is going to be here. And you're going to see that, all right, well, variance of x1 is 1. Variance of x2 is 2. So that means that there's a lot more variance along this dimension than this dimension, twice as much. But there's also this negative covariance, which means that as x1 increases, x2 is going to decrease, which means that you're going to see a cloud that looks like this when you sample points from this vector space. So you're going to have a, you know, an axis there where the data is going to fall. And that comes from this covariance here. As one is increasing, the other one is decreasing, which means that you're going to have this slope in the, in the distribution that you're going to sample. If I had another distribution, um, variance 1, 2, um, maybe 0 0.1 times square root of 2, 0 0.1 times square root of 2, so almost no covariance there, then what I would see is something like this. So more variability in x2 than x1, but no covariance between them. And similarly, if this was now a large number, if, if, we, if I had positive covariance between them, then I would see something like this. OK. So let me now go back to our maximum likelihood estimate. From the maximum likelihood estimate, show you what is our uncertainty in our measurement w, on our estimate w. And then I want to show you how that relates to our measurement noise in one hand and how the input space was sampled. So we can see the relationship between these, these, um, these two different variables. So um, we'll just briefly review our basic model. Let's see if I can find a slightly better pen. So suppose that we have a model that says what I measure on any given trial is the truth on that trial plus some noise. So this is my measurement noise, where epsilon is associated with some variability sigma squared. And this, this truth, y star, is going to be generated by some w Let's put a star there, transpose xi. So there really is this, this true relationship between input x and these weights that I'm trying to estimate and this y star. But I can't see the true um, y star. All I can see is y star plus some measurement noise, epsilon. So then what we have is that probability of yi given xi and sigma is this normal distribution with mean um, w transpose xi and variance sigma squared. And um, then, you know, when I, when I want to estimate my parameter in a, in a maximum likelihood way, I have a whole bunch of data points. So I have, I want to maximize the probability of y1, yn given x1 
xn, and uh, this parameter variance sigma, and that's the maximum that likelihood, this is a likelihood function, and that's just a multiplication of these individual probabilities, which is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi sigma squared to the 1 half. Um, my observation minus this truth squared, which um, is equal to um, I have n of these times And we can write the log likelihood now this is going to be the log of this function it's going to be equal to minus n over 2 log of 2 pi minus n log of sigma minus 1 over 2 sigma squared this sum And to find our best estimate of w, we uh, minimize this log with respect to the thing that we're trying to find, w. So we find the derivative of the log with respect to this parameter that we're trying to find. And if you remember, we can write this as um, uh, y minus xw transpose y minus xw, where these are the now vectors. And x is x1, 1, x1, 2, xm1, x1, n, xm, n, and w is w1, wm. So um, we find that we multiply that out, find the derivative with respect to w, and it becomes um, uh, I think one over two sigma squared, something like minus two um, think x transpose y plus 2 x transpose x w. Check that, see if it's right. Uh, wow, amazingly it is. It's pretty good. OK, so then we set that equal to 0. We, we find w, and we get the equation that you guys remember. It's x transpose x minus 1, x transpose y. And now what I'm interested in is the meaning of the variance about this. This is my estimate. This is the maximum likelihood estimate that we've seen now a couple of times. Now what I'm interested in is knowing something about well, what is my uncertainty about this estimate. And the point that I want to show you is that my uncertainty about this estimate depends not just on my measurement noise sigma, but also on x's, how these x's were, were sampled. And so to do that, let me write now the variance of um, uh, my estimate, variance of w hat. And well, w hat is equal to this, so let me write this in terms of the, the function. So before I do this, let me just write w hat. That's equal to x transpose x minus 1, x transpose times y. But what is y? y 
is equal to y star plus this noise. And now let me write these as vectors, y star and epsilon. Epsilon is going to be all the noises that I had on each trial. Y star is going to be the true measurement on that trial times um, uh, x transpose. OK, so that, 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 that's my solution. So now the variance of w hat. My uncertainty here is going to be this has no uncertainty. The only source of noise is here, the variance of this epsilon, which is equal to identity matrix times sigma squared. This is a scalar. This is the identity matrix times this transpose, which is x times x transpose x minus 1. And when I multiply that out, I see that x transpose x minus 1 times x transpose x, it just cancels out. So I see sigma squared x transpose x minus 1. So that's my variance of my, of my estimate. Now what I want to do is that I want to spend a little bit of time showing you what this means. So what is this inverse of x transpose x? The point is that my uncertainty in what I'm trying to estimate depends on measurement noise as well as how the input space was sampled. So let's see what that means. Suppose, suppose what I do is I have five trials. Suppose I'm going I'm to give you five trials and x is made up of a two-dimensional vector, x1 and x2. y is just, a, is just a scalar. And w that I'm trying to estimate is w1 and w2. So suppose x1 is going to be given to you, x2 is going to be given to you, and of course y star will not be given to you. But what you have is y, which is equal to you know, some true x, some true w times x, plus this epsilon here. So suppose that in this case, I knew the y star. So I'm going to give you an example of a, one of these scenarios. So suppose that we have 1, 0, 1 in this case. Oh, sorry, 0.5, I guess. My first example, y star is going to be 0.5. Second one is going to be exactly the same. Third one is going to be exactly the same. Fourth one is going to be exactly the same. Fifth one is going to be this. So if the true data was generated from this, and this is trial 1, trial 2, trial 3, trial 4, trial 5, the true data was gener generated like this. That means that, of course, on this trial, you know x1 and x2. And y that, that I actually measure is 0 0.5 plus some noise in that first trial. So that's, that's what I give you, right? The true 0 0.5 plus this noise. But what I'm going to do now is I say, OK, from here, I can compute this variance. So clearly, my, w, my w hat, my estimate of w, is going to be equal to what? What's my estimate of w? For this to be true, for this data to be generated. So I have x1 is 1, x2 is 0, y star is 0 0.5, and I also have another condition where x1 is 0, x2 is 1, and y star is 0 0.5. So what's my estimate of w? 0.5, 0.5. Good. All right. But what do you think will be my estimate of the uncertainty of w? Well, let's compute it. So what's x? x is equal to 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. I multiply this by x transpose, and I invert it like this. And what do I get? I get x transpose x minus 1. It's going to be equal to some matrix here. But I want to see if you can guess what, what's going to go in this matrix. Look what's going on here. I get four instances of, of x and only one instance of x2. So I get four instances of x1, one instance of x2. So if you're thinking about uncertainty, 
then you should have a guess that, well, I'm going to know a lot about x1 and hardly anything about x2. Because it was only on once. Most of the time, x1 was on. So what I would expect is that I'm going to have a small number here, but a large number here. And in fact, when you multiply x transpose x and invert it, you get one quarter here, and you get a one here. And the second thing that you notice is that you never have these two on at the same time, which means that there is no covariance between them. So then you're going to get zero and zero here. Okay. And so what this means is that when you look at your uncertainty about w, it's going to be proportional to your up measurement noise, which whatever that is, and how the input space was sampled. Which means that if I write what my w, w looks like, this is my w2, this is w1. Of course, the mean of it is going to be here, right? And the variance of it is going to be small in this dimension, large in this dimension. So it's going to look like this. This means that if I took this data and generated real data with it. So th I know the true value. I add some noise to it. On, after I take five, five of these data points, I estimate my mean. I estimate my variance. And I compute what my uncertainty is. I'm going to have a whole lot of certainty about W1, but very uncertain about W2. Let me stop for a second and see if you understood that. Questions? Let's do another one. Suppose my x1 and x2 look like this. So in this case, the x matrix is just this, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then x transpose x minus 1 is going to be another matrix. And that matrix, let's see if you can guess what, what's going to be inside of it. So first of all, you have a whole lot of cases where x1 is available to you, and almost as many cases where x2 is available to you. So you're basically going to have about the same amount of certainty about the variances of x1 and x2, which means that these two are going to be about the same. And then you have this other condition where whenever x1 was on, x2 was on as well. So they covaried together. They were on together. And in fact, what it means is that for this equation to hold, x1 plus x2 being equal to y multiplied by some weight, if this were to increase, this has to decrease for this thing to hold. So that means they're going to have negative covariance. This means there's going to be a negative number here. And indeed, when we multiply these out, that's what we get. This is 1. This is about 1.25. So this is a little bit more than this. And this is minus 1. So when we find w in this case, Again, it's going to be the mean of 0 0.5. It's still the same mean as this. But you notice that the input history is very different, which means my uncertainty about w is going to be very different. And that uncertainty is going to be associated with a negative covariance, which means that it's going to look like this. So. The history of the inputs is reflected in our uncertainty. The past is going to be reflected in what we know about this parameter w. And that is really the idea behind what Coleman did. What Coleman was saying is that you, when you're trying to do your estimation, you have all the past, and then you have this current data point. And if you're talking about Gaussian noise, all the past 
is really in two parameters, mean and variance. The current data point can be incorporated into the history of the past by taking into account this measure of uncertainty, this uncertainty that I have about the parameter that I'm trying to estimate. So let's now get to our common estimation. Any questions so far? All right, guys. Let's see what, what he did. OK. So suppose we're trying to estimate some parameter w. And I'm going to have some trial n plus 1. That's going to be some function of its parameter value in trial n plus something that I'm going to call sensitivity to error. Which is also called the common gain here. Times the difference between what I observed on that trial minus what I predicted on that trial. So this is our basic learning equation, right? I make a prediction of what should happen. I make an observation about what did happen. And I want to change my estimates, w, based on this k, this notion of sensitivity. And this is going to be a function of that trial. It depends on what, what that specific um, trial I'm at. And what, uh, of course, for example, you know, when, when we were doing maximum likelihood, what, what, we were, what we saw was that if I have two kinds of information, say that you know, I have these two GPSs, one of them is telling me I'm here, the other one's telling me I'm here. The way I combine them is by taking into account the variance of these two things, the uncertainty about each one of those measurements, right? So what Coleman is going to be thinking about is that he's going to say, this is one of your pieces of information. This is info one. This is what you believe about the world, all the stuff that you've seen, learned in the past. And based on that, you make this prediction which then gives you a second piece of information. So this difference, this error, is your second piece of information. You're going to have to combine one piece of information with another piece of information. And how do we do it? Well, this k here should be set in a way that reflects the uncertainties you have in each of these two pieces of information. Uncertainty in w, uncertainty in this error that you're measuring. And by knowing these two uncertainties, we can weigh these two things and then combine them to form this, uh, this new estimate w. So um, that's basically the, the process. And so what we want to do is to find a way to combine these two pieces of information in such a way that the, we, we, you know, we optimize some, something. And that optimization is going to be associated with variance of these w's, which are my uncertainties. So to to change things slightly, what I want to do now is to not just talk about trial n, but think about it in terms of what, what we might imagine is our generative model. So, so there's something that we're trying to estimate, w, something that we measure, y, and another thing that we measure, x. And this y here depends on w and x. And so at the beginning, we have an estimate. Let's call this w hat on trial n given all the things that we've seen in the past. So I have an estimate of this w. This is my prior belief. Before I see anything, I have this estimate of what this is, given that all the past things that I've seen. So now I make an observation, y of n. After I've made the observation, I update my belief about w hat. So this is my prior. This is my observation. This is my posterior. So I begin with some guess. I make an observation. I change my belief after I've made that observation. So we're going to use this kind of terminology. Estimate of n at trial n, given that I've seen n minus 1 previous trials. I see the nth trial. Now I make another estimate, which is called my posterior, on the nth trial, given that I just saw the nth trial. OK, and then for the next trial, I just say, this is my estimate of n plus 1, given that I've seen n trials. So this becomes my prior on the next trial. On trial n, 
I have a guess. That guess is based on all the past history that I've seen. I make my guess, I make an observation. After I've made the observation, I change my guess. That's called the posterior. Okay? And then on the next trial, I'm going to make another guess. That's going to be my prior on that guess, and so forth. Now what we want to know is to how do we set this? This we observe, this we guess, this we have formed based on the past history. So let's write this equation w of n given n is equal to w hat of n given n minus 1 plus k of n times y of n minus y hat, which is going to be w, I'm going to write it as a little bit easier for us to write it this way, x of n transpose w hat of n given n minus 1. So our typical learning problem, just a little bit more confusion here for you that, that we're going to keep track of all the things that we've seen in the past. We're going to call this the posterior, this the prior, this the observation. So what Coleman said is that set this parameter k, your sensitivity, in such a way that after you change your w, your posterior, you end up with a quantity in which you are as certain as possible in what you have estimated. So he said, in addition to having these estimates, which really are the mean of your distribution, you also have a variance associated with it. So you have a variance of w hat of n given n minus 1. We're going to define that as this matrix P n given n minus 1. So my uncertainty about my estimate, I'm going to call it p. This is my mean, this is my variance. Just like here. So this is my mean, this point here is the mean of my estimate. This is here. This, sigma squared times this, is my variance of my belief. So we're going to call that P, that matrix. There's going to be some uncertainty in that estimate. And, and you see that when we were doing regression, there was a very clear relationship between the past history and this variance. So what Coleman said is that find this parameter k in such a way that you minimize the posterior variance, P of n given n. So find w. Change in W, make it such that when you set this K, this becomes as small as possible. Now, we'll have to talk a little bit about what we mean by that, because this is a matrix. And so what do you mean by making it small? We have to have some norm associated with it, which I'll show you what it is. But for now, let's just multiply this out. Let's see what we get. So this is, this is my function. So let me multiply it out. So I get W hat of n given n is equal to W hat of n given n minus 1 plus k of n, y of n minus k of n, x of n transpose w to the hat given n minus 1. So then w hat of n given n is going to be equal to i minus k of n, x of n transpose All right, so um, the, other, the other element here is that this y is made up of this w star transpose x of n plus sigma. So we can also substitute that in there, and that becomes the equation. Now, what do we want to do? We want to find the posterior uncertainty. We want to find p of n given n and then minimize that with respect to k. Find the k that minimizes the posterior uncertainty. So that's, that's where we're going.
So let's find the variance um, of that equation. Because that's going to be the, the thing that we're going to try to minimize. So the variance of w hat of n given n. What is the variance of this equation? That's going to be p of n given n. And that's equal to So the first term, I have i minus kx times w hat. The variance of that is i minus kx times the variance of w times i minus k transpose. The second term is k of n times y. The only random variable there is epsilon. The variance of it is k of n times sigma squared, where sigma squared is the variance of, of epsilon. So that's, that's the variance. And um, uh, let, me, let me now multiply this out. So that, uh, um, so that we, we find a norm associated with that variance. So because we have to define what do we mean minimize variance, because variance is a matrix. So I don't know what, the, what does it mean to minimize a matrix. I have to give you a norm associated with that matrix. But before I do that, let me, let me multiply this out. So I get p of n, n minus 1, minus. So what we need to do is minimize this variance covariance matrix. So what is this P? In principle, what it is is a covariance structure in which the, the, the diagonal elements are the variances of individual elements, sigma 1, sigma 2, however size the number of parameters m we have. And then these are the covariances, row 1, row 1, row 2, and so forth. And a good norm, so what is a norm? The qualities of norm as follows. Norm of something has to be always positive. It's one quantity. Second thing is, norm is 0 when that quantity is identically 0. Right? So in this case, if we use trace as a norm, trace of a covariance matrix, which is the sum of the diagonal elements, First of all, the sum of the diagonal elements is always going to be positive because they're all squared quantities, right? Second, if the trace is 0, that matrix has to be 0. Why? Because, first of all, all the elements in the center are positive, so nothing can cancel each other out. They all have to be 0. And if sigma 1 is 0, if sigma 2 is 0, if sigma 3 is 0, then all the covariances have to be 0 as well. So trace of a variance covariance matrix has a special property of being a norm. That's not true for any general matrix, but for a variance covariance matrix, a trace is a norm. So we're going to minimize the trace of this posterior variance covariance matrix. And by doing that, what I mean is we want to find the derivative of this with respect to k of n and set it equal to 0. So that's, that's the direction that we're going. So OK, um, let's see if we can do it. So the 
we're going to find the trace of this quantity and then find its derivative with respect to k of n, set it equal to zero, find k, and see what that, what's going to tell us there. So let's, let's move forward. So trace of p of n given n, the posterior quantity. That's going to be equal to, trace of course is just a number, it's a scalar, right? It's going to be the trace of this. Uh, I wonder if I should factor things out. Let me check my notes. No, I guess I, I left them. I left them as they are. Um, these two terms here, the trace of, so trace is going to be a scalar. So this term, its trace, is going to be equal to this term, the tr its trace. And so I can write this as minus 2 times um, the trace of, because trace of a quantity is the same as the trace of the, it doesn't matter if you transpose it or not. So this quantity is the same as this quantity, except it's transpose, so they're, they're the same quantities. So I'm going to write it as k of n, x of n transpose, p of n, n minus 1. I took care of this equation. And then I have this, this quantity. Now if you look at this quantity, the term in the center here is a scalar, right? x transpose p times x, that's a scalar quantity. So I can write it as follows. Um, and yet, well, I'll do, it in, I'll do it in two steps so we can clearly see it. Right, this is a scalar times k of n. And this whole thing is a scalar, so I can write this as times the transpose there. Let's see, I am missing, um, I'm missing a k transpose here, right, because that's k times sigma, so it's k times variance of, uh, k times uh, epsilon, so k times variance of epsilon times k transpose, so it's a k transpose here, k transpose here. Right. So this, this term, I just rewrote it as this. All right. So the trace of this is equal to trace of this plus trace of this plus trace of this quantity here. So I forgot to put my trace there, which is equal to trace of this quantity. So let me now write the whole thing down. So this is equal to trace trace of k of n, k of n transpose. Um, this quantity here, the trace of the trace of a matrix times matrix transpose. So th that's a vector. So so trace of k times k transpose. That's equal to trace of what's k k times k transpose. It's going to be so k times k transpose is going to be k1 km times k1 km and that's going to be equal to this matrix the trace of k1 squared k2 squared km squared and then these these off diagonal terms don't matter that trace is going to be equal to k1 
times k transpose is going to be equal to the sum of k1, ki, where i goes to 1 to m, which is equal to k transpose k. So trace of k, k transpose for any vector k is equal to k transpose k. So this term here is just kk transpose. Um, I don't know if I can simplify that. Let me see. Right, it's a scalar. So this, this becomes Trace of this is a scalar quantity, which is which is in this case x of n transpose p of n n minus one k of n plus times k of n transpose k of n. Trace of this is the same as trace of this transpose, because it doesn't matter what the, um, what the matrix is. The trace of a matrix is equal to the trace of that matrix transpose. So I just did a transpose here. K goes out there, and it becomes, um, it becomes a scalar quantity. All right, so next what I have is the problem of finding the derivative of that equation. We're going to find the derivative of this with respect to K. Let me check to see if I have any errors in my equation. It looks all right, but no, it looks okay. Okay, so let me find its derivative with respect to k. Got to write on that board. All right, so derivative of trace of p of n given n with respect to k of n is going to be equal to derivative of this with respect to k minus 2 xn transpose p of n n minus 1. This has to be transpose, right? Because we want a vector. We want a um, m by 1 vector, which this doesn't give us. This is going to be p of n, n minus 1 times x of n, um, plus derivative of that with respect to k, which is going to be 2 times times um, k of n. So now I solve for k of n. I set this equal to 0, and I solve for it. It's going to be equal to um, x of n transpose. Minus one times. Okay, so let me stop for a second and just show you what this means. So what this says is that your mixing term k, which is how we're going to combine, how we're going to combine our observation with our prior belief, is going to be a ratio. It's going to be a ratio of this term and my prior uncertainty. So let's see what this is, x transpose p of n, x of n. So where does this come from? Well, your observation y of n was equal to x of n transpose w of n plus epsilon. So this term here is the uncertainty in your measurement. 
because the variance of y is going to be x transpose uncertainty of w times x plus sigma squared, which is the, the, the uncertainty in my measurement. So, so this is measurement uncertainty. This is my prior uncertainty. This is my belief, right? Before I started, I said I'm going to have some belief w is going to have some uncertainty with that p. So it's saying to weigh the prior uncertainty and its ratio to your measurement uncertainty, and then use that as a way to combine your error in prediction in terms of updating your belief. So it's saying that you just measured something, and there was an error between what you measured and what you predicted, right? That's the top, top equation, y minus y hat. It's saying multiply it by a quantity that's the ratio between your prior uncertainty, p of n given n, and your measurement uncertainty, the ratio of those two. So if your prior uncertainty was very low, then k is going to be small. It's not going to change very much. It's going to say, sh sure, you had a prediction error, but you were so certain about what you predicted that I'm not going to believe this prediction error. It's a ratio of two things. It's a ratio of the prior uncertainty, p of n given n minus 1, and the current measurement uncertainty, which is the quantity in, the, um, in, that, in that inverse. In this case, it's a scalar, so we don't need to worry um, about the inverse. But in general, um, in general, maybe a, a matrix quantity, which I'll show you in in a, min in a minute. So okay, so this is my this is my uh, um, the, my estimate w of n plus one given w uh, of n. So I have now w of n given n is equal to w of n given n minus 1 plus k of n times y of n minus my estimate, y hat of n. Okay, so I know how to get this equation now because I know k. I know based on my prior uncertainty and the current inputs x and my measurement noise how to set k so I can get my posterior belief. But what about my posterior uncertainty, p of n, given n? So this is my mean of where I believe my parameters are. What about my variance of that parameter? Because I need to set both of these. So this comes from this equation. This comes from this equation. So p of n given n depends on p of n given n minus 1 and k of n. k of n, I just computed for you here. So I'm just going to put k of n into this equation. And then simplify it, and, and we're going to get a p of n given n. So p of n given n is equal to k of n is this. times xn transpose p of n given n okay then i have this term times this k again so I won't write it down, I'll just put a parenthesis there, plus k of n times this term here, x of n transpose p of n n minus 1 x of n plus sigma squared times k of n transpose. So you see that basically I'm just going to plug in k of n 
and simplify. And it's, it's not difficult. It's just a bunch of multiplications. And a whole lot of things cancel out. You can see it here. You see how k has this term in it? And we just have the same term here, but without the inverse. So this is going to cancel in that term. And when I, when I do it, what I'm going to get is that p of n given n is going to be equal to identity minus k of n times x of n transpose p of n n minus 1. OK. So what I have are two equations. Here's my common gain for that trial. It depends on my prior uncertainty and the current measurement, x, that was given. Here's my equation for changing my mean of the estimate, k. Here's the equation for changing the variance of the estimate. So what I have now is that on every trial, I have formed a technique for computing a posterior belief given that I start with a prior belief. So remember what my prior was. I had this w, and I had its mean and its variance. So this is my prior. I make an observation, which is made up of y of n and x of n. And then I make a posterior estimate. And p of n given n. And I do this by computing my common gain, k of n. OK? All right. So let's. Um, one final thing. You can, you can sort of begin to see that, for example, see the posterior variance? It is multiplying something less than 1 times the prior variance. So in principle, your variances will get smaller as you um, uh, as you do this, simply because when you combine two things, you're going to get something better than if you hadn't combined it, just like when we had two GPSs. So the posterior variances become smaller as you get more data. The second thing to notice is that um, this function, k, this k that I'm computing, it depends on x's, the inputs that I'm seeing, as well as the history of those x's, which are in the p. So p is the uncertainty matrix. And in the uncertainty matrix, I keep a history of all the paths that I've seen. I take a current estimate. I have all the past history that I've seen. And by combining the two, I form the, the, uh, my posterior. So in principle, the problem of state estimation, which is an example of it, is the way we've been doing our estimating w is as follows. So there's some parameter that you're trying to estimate. It's called a w. That w gets observed by these quantities, x and y. And it could be that on any given trial, you know, you form your, uh, your prior. I have my prior belief, w of n given n minus 1. This is my prior. I make my measurement, y of n, x of n. I compute. I also have p of n given n minus 1. I compute my k of n. I form my posterior w of n given n from k. The difference between my prediction and my observation. And then I also form my posterior this, p of n given n. All right. So now, in, in principle, there will be a next trial. So I'm going to have another trial that looks like this. OK. Now what's the relationship between w in this trial and w in previous trial? So 
do we know, is this the same system that we're going to be estimating again, or is this a completely different system? In principle, we think that there is a relationship, so I'm going to draw an arrow between the two. And in all the experiments, all the things we've been talking about so far, we assume that this relationship is identity. So w and n plus 1, we assume is the same thing as w and n. So we don't think the system is changing between one trial and the next trial. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be some matrix A that defines the relationship between one trial and the next trial. What this means is that the generative model looks like this. W of n plus 1 is equal to A times W of n plus epsilon, where epsilon is some normal distribution with 0 and Q, its variance covariance matrix. And our observation is equal to x of n transpose w of n plus another epsilon. Let's call this epsilon w, epsilon y. This is my measurement noise, and this is my state noise. So this is called state equation. This is called the measurement equation. So the idea now that I want to tell you is that there's a system out there that you're trying to estimate some parameter w for it. And until now, we've been assuming that in a given trial, when we see x and y, and we're trying to estimate w, in the next trial, that w is the same as the previous w. But in principle, there could be some uncertainty in, the, in our belief that this is the same w. So I can write it like this. I can say that w in trial n plus 1 is the same as wn multiplied by some matrix A, which could be identity. But there's also some noise in my belief about this particular state update equation. And that my measurement, y of n, is related to w associated with some x, but it also has some measurement noise. So this is my measurement noise. This is my state noise. And in the experiments that we've been talking so far, A was identity, epsilon w had variance 0. But it doesn't have to have variance 0. It could have variance q. So this doesn't change any of the math that we've been describing so far. What it does is the following. So, so far, what I've done is that I have a prior mean and variance. I have a measurement. I compute k, and I compute a posterior. Now, what's my prior on the next trial? So now my prior in trial n plus 1 is going to be w in trial n given n, my posterior here, times a, which is this, is this equation. That's going to be my posterior. This is going to be my prior on this trial. So this is going to be w of n, sorry, n plus 1 given n. This is my prior in trial n plus 1. And there's going to be a variance, p of n plus 1 given n, is going to be equal to um, uh, a times p of n given n a transpose plus q, which is basically the, the variance, in the prior variance in here. So if I only have this amount of information, I compute a prior. I compute a measurement. I update, my pro I, I update my weight based on what I saw, and I form a posterior. Now what I need to do is propagate my information to the next trial. What's the relationship between the next trial and the current trial? This is the equation that tells me that relationship. It says, on the next trial, your w is going to be related to this w by this matrix A, but there's going to be some uncertainty in it as well. We're going to call that epsilon w. And so in order for me now to compute my posterior on the next trial, w of, I'm sorry, my prior in the next trial, w of n plus 1 given n, what I do is that I take w of n given n multiplied by a to get this. This is the mean of my prior. This is the variance of my prior. p of n plus 1 given n is a times variance of this plus q. And so then I compute, so this is my this is my prior on trial n plus 1. I compute k of n plus 1, the same as before. I update, I update my belief about w.
and I form now the posterior of that weight. So the reason why I wanted to show you the relationship between prior in one case, the posterior, and then the prior in the next is because in principle the system can have uncertainty in the way the parameter that we're trying to estimate will, will transform. So for example, um, say the thing that we're trying to estimate is the state of some object, a rocket that has been sent off. We're trying to estimate that position over that, that object. Well, that position is going to change. right? It's not going to be constant. That position is going to depend on the thrust that we gave, some input that we gave to it. So in this case, the position that we're trying to estimate depends on the commands that we've been given it, and then we have some telemetry from it. Occasionally we get feedback, saying it's here, it's here, it's here. Every time we get feedback, it allows us to make an estimate of where it actually is. But then, if we don't have any other information, at the time we get feedback, we get an estimate of where it is, and then we're going to have to project forward in time where is it later. So in that case, W isn't going to be constant. It's going to change. And it's going to change based on our knowledge of the dynamics of that system. So for example, there could be other things in this equation. There could be inputs that we've given it so that thing can move based on some, some things that we've done. So the thing that we're trying to estimate could change, but nevertheless, the same mathematics that we use to estimate this weight, which is what we thought was constant, can be used to estimate you know, variables that can change in time. And that's where we're going. And that's where Coleman filters are, they make their biggest bang, is basically estimating states of linear dynamical systems. So in linear dynamical systems, you have inputs that you give, the state of that system changes, occasionally you get feedback from it, and then you're going to say, okay, where, what's the state of the system? And that state is going to be measured through occasional measurements, but also based on beliefs about where it is, which comes from that top equation. So that's going to be the prior that you're going to combine with your measurement, and you're going to then form a posterior that says this is where it's actually located. And the, the, the whole process is based on minimizing this trace of the uncertainty, the posterior uncertainty. And why a trace? Because trace associated with a variance-covariance matrix is a norm. It's minimizing a positive number that's associating with the uncertainty of your estimate. You want to estimate it in such a way that you get maximize maximize the, how certain you are. OK, I'll stop if there are any questions. You have plenty of homework examples to try this out and get to learn what it's about. Anyway, the, the material is also written in the book. Uh, if, you, if you want to take a look at it, it will provide you with further insight. All right, guys, thank you so much. See you Wednesday. <laughs>